So next up, we've got Dr. Chris Rodemaker. Uh, he'll be presenting uh, Next Step in FAD Preparedness and How to Integrate Available Resources. Dr. Rodemaker is a clinical professor at ISU uh, and, the IS and is the ISU Swine Extension Veterinarian in the Veterinary Diagnostic and Production Animal Medicine Department. <clears throat> Dr. Rodemaker is also the Associate Director of the Owl Pork Industry Center. Dr. Rodemaker received his Bachelor of Science and Doctorate of Veterinary Medicine from the University of Minnesota in 1998. Following graduation, he joined New Fashion Pork as the Director of Health Services. In 2009, he joined Smithfield Foods as the Director of Production Improvement, and in December of 2014, he accepted the position of Swine Extension Veterinarian at Iowa State University. So thank you, Chris, uh, for being here and for presenting. Thank you very much, Matt. Good afternoon, everybody. All right, in keeping with our theme with foreign animal disease preparation, so it was really nice to be able to hear Dr. Shear and glad we could uh, get him back, uh, get him back here and, and have him share a little bit of his experiences and wisdom. So I'm um, going to give a little bit of credit here up front. This actually, some of the slides you're going to see actually were donated by a really nice uh, co-presentation that uh, Dr. Pam Zabel with the National Pork Board and Dr. Tyler Hulk, uh, who works uh, here part-time with Iowa State working on the U.S. SHIP program, did a really nice co-presentation down at World Pork Expo. So they were kind enough to be able to share some of the slides that you'll see here. And, and really, we're kind of talking about the next, next step in FAD preparation. I know working here with Matt and the rest of the crew at uh, Iowa Pork Industry Center when uh, uh, ASF broke out in 2018. You know, we'd been talking about it. I think that's kind of when things got real for everybody, you know, because knowing the amount of ingredients and supplies that we get from China that uh, uh, we really responded and reached out to Pam. She helped us put some workshops and some educational material together. Um, you know, so we started working on that, then COVID hits, but uh, Pam and Tyler, and you're going to see a lot of good work continued, has really continued to happen, kind of, you know, continuing in the background as obviously as Dr. Shear shared with us, the, the threat hasn't gotten any less, it continues to migrate and move closer uh, with us. So we're going to talk kind of about uh, some of the outcomes of all that preparation and, and kind of what the next steps really truly are. So. If we kind of think about it, we're going to hear a little bit about U.S. SHIP and SPS and IDOLS and USDA APHIS and CSSC and AGVIEW, right? And boy, we sure do love our acronyms. I know veterinarians in particular are, are um, uh, certainly, uh, we uh, have been laid, laid that, that claim in the past, but we're going to talk about them today. So let's see if we can do, a, 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 my job here is to try to define them a little bit and the nice thing is what you're going to see is they're really going to be a repeating theme and how these really kind of all work together and, and really starting to assist us in putting almost a national plan or a national playbook together. So that's really kind of the goal and the scope here is how do all these different acronyms, these are all talking about programs or program players, how do they all work together in kind of this next step? Um, so this is a, a really nice slide. I thought that Pam said, you're going to see this, this theme is going to repeat itself multiple times throughout the presentation. And amongst these different programs, they kind of have these three fundamental tenets amongst all of them. So we've got traceability, biosecurity, and surveillance. So obviously, biosecurity, we talked about that with Dr. Diane. You know, she's talking about endemic diseases. Uh, we understand their importance, uh, but it's going to be, you know, that's going to be vitally important in the early stages of an FAD outbreak. Traceability, you know, we're going to want to uh, quickly trace back when that first case gets officially diagnosed, you know, so there's a lot of preparation we can do. A lot of that is about getting our pins, our premise identification numbers, getting those, make sure they're, um, the cor they're correct, make sure we have them for all our sites and get them into electronic software along with the, the pig movement so that we can quickly do that uh, contact tracing. You know, it's always like everything goes back to the most recent thing, right? So everything goes back to COVID. You know, we talked about contact tracing. This, if we get an FAD event, this is gonna be our version of contact tracing, right? They're gonna wanna be able to do that. That's all, it kind of fits within that bucket of traceability. Surveillance, that's kind of the third key about that. You know, that obviously it's going to be testing for foreign animal disease, but it's also going to be, uh, which is going to be key in that early detection, but also 
Uh, you know, as Dr. Shear says, as difficult as it may be for some of those diseases that may look like stuff that we already have, we're going to make sure we're training our caretakers to know what they look like, at least enough to say, hey, this something here doesn't look quite right. I need to contact my veterinarian so that veterinarian, if they come out and take a look at it and they can say, yep, we need to, we need to contact uh, state and federal officials and initiate an FAD investigation. So this is when things get really real, right? So I know as we're doing our, our FAD uh, workshops, uh, you know, over the past few years and some of the feedback from Matt and, and, and uh, the other guys at the Iowa Pork Industry Center, this is the thing as, you know, we start talking with producers, this is the part when things get real. They're like, you mean I'm not gonna be able to move animals for 72 hours when we find the first case of a foreign animal disease? That's kind of when things get real. And you can see I put 72 hours with question marks by it, right? So that's kind of the handle it got put on it, which is 72 hours. And it could be longer than that, right? 72 hours is, is we're gonna make sure that we're gonna cease any new movements. You know, you can see here anything that's in transit's gonna kind of have a grace period until it can find a home. But the goal in that time period is to do those contact tracing, just like kind of like the COVID, right? We're gonna to want to be able to find from that site where a confirmed positive has taken place, we wanna look for all the da potentially dangerous contacts, right? So where in the last 30 days, where have pigs shipped from that site? Where have pigs shipped to that site? What are all those? So all that epidemiological investigation, that's where all that traceability is gonna take place. And part of the reason why I put the 72 hours in question marks, that's gonna be, they're gonna, they'll take a, a look at 72 hours and they'll say, okay, do we feel confident at that time that we feel like we've identified all those dangerous contacts? If the answer to that is yes, and they've got the control, they've got the potential infected sites quarantined and the control areas identified, you know, then then they'll probably, you know, then the possibility for them to raise the standstill will happen. If the answer to that is no, it's probably going to extend beyond 72 hours. Okay, so pork producers and caretakers, we have, we have, you know, we there is the potential for us to influence that, and and it really ties back to this FAD preparation, right? So the, the more of those premises that we have the PREM IDs done, have them correct, we have, electron, we have our movements, but we have that movement data electronically collected so that we can easily hand it over to the state animal health and federal officials so they can upload it into their software of choice. That's gonna make that epidemiological investigation go much quicker. The faster those epidemiological investigations go, the more likely we, the faster we can move that clock in those 72 hours. So this all goes, ties back to why that's so important that we've gotta be prepared. And we'll see that these, these different programs, you know, there's a lot of overlap between these different programs that we're gonna talk about, but it is important. It is part of our responsibility to some of the things that we can really influence. <clears throat> oh, and I did wanna say something too about the standstill. Obviously during that time period, there'll be no live animal or semen movements. Uh, some of the questions that we do get, and, and Dr. Kaizen, he'll, he'll probably be able to touch on this as he's talking about the state of FAD prep. We get questions, well, what about feed? What about rendering? Will that be involved in that standstill or not? And his answer, and rightfully so, will be it depends. It depends on the, the type of outbreak that we have, you know. So that may be one. So that, that's part of that FAD preparation, right? You need to be planning. If I can't get feed, what do I need to do over that 72 hours of potentially longer? If I don't have access for a short period of time to rendering, if that's, a, if that's my primary mortality disposal, what am I going to do for on-farm disposal if it's, you know, three, four, five days that I don't have access to? That's all part of the FAD prep, you know, preparation that we need to be thinking about. Okay, so we said during that uh, time period, they're going to be doing the epidemiological investigations. They're going to go ahead and draw, you know, circles around infected sites, and maybe it's only one site, and they draw, you know, uh, it's one control area. It could be multiple control areas. You know, it could be a county. It could be multiple counties. It could be a state. It really is going to depend on uh, the extent, once they identify the first case or cases, uh, how extensive that infection network really looks like. So, uh, so, Farms are gonna need, if they're in those control areas, you know, we know all those pig farms within those control areas are gonna be quarantined. Those farms may need a movement permit if they're gonna move animals. If they're, even though they may not have the disease, they'll obviously be tested, they're gonna need a movement permit to move animals or semen off that. 
still within that control area. So, so how do these different programs fit together in these different type of areas? Okay, so here's just kind of, uh, if we said, well, let's say the first case, we've just got one infected site and here's a control area. So you've kind of got your infected site there in red and you've got an infected zone around it and then you have a buffer zone around that infected site. That's kind of dictated as your total control area. So that infected site, you're gonna get, if you're uh, the unfortunate person involved with that, you're gonna get a lot of help. You're going to have working with your state and federal health officials. You're going to be using the red books there. You can see the African swine fever uh, disease response uh, strategy booklet. So that that's kind of that farm there. That's that uh, they're going to get uh, the assistance from the state and federal officials on what to do with that. What happens if you're one of the farms that are in that control zone, but you're not infected with the virus, but you're certainly infected by the control zone because you're in the quarantine zone, you can't not move your animals without a permit. So that's where the secure pork supply really falls into, into place there, and we'll cover where that is. And then U.S. ship, that's really kind of for everybody else, everybody within the free area. But what you're going to see about the nice thing about all those programs is there's a lot of overlap between them, right? So if we look at some of the fundamental tenets uh, within each of those programs, they're gonna wanna look at movement records within the last uh, you know, 30 days. They're gonna wanna make sure you have a premises identification. There could be diagnostic testing involved. There's gonna be a biosecurity plan uh, that needs to be written and enacted. Uh, obviously, you'll have, if you're the infected site, you're going to have to have the population and disposable plan, but once again, you'll, you'll have some guidance uh, working with the state and federal officials on that. But you can see with a lot of that, there's just a lot of, um, there's a lot of overlap with that. So it kind of gives you an idea um, uh, of things that we can be doing uh, to work together with that. Secure pork, that plan's probably been around the longest. Like I say, Dr. Zabel, uh, she's been intimately involved with that, so any questions on that, you can feel free to run her down with that. But it's been funded by the USDA and Pork Checkoff, so it's been a nice collaborative program. Um, you know, it's a voluntary program. There's a lot of resources, and securepork.org is where all this information is. I highly advise going to that uh, website. Uh, you can see from a traceability standpoint, uh, you'll uh, be able to obtain your premises identification. And even if you have one, many, in many cases, one of the FAD prep activities that we discuss about is you may have gotten one maybe initially, um, but sometimes maybe that was at the office. Maybe it doesn't have the proper address for the actual site where the site got uh, cited to. So uh, there's tools uh, to go ahead and validate to make sure you're at the correct premises. So that's a, always a good FAD prep uh, type activity is to validate your prem ID, make sure it's got the correct address, the 911 address and the correct latitude and longitude. Uh, recording those animal movements obviously is going to be important if you get involved uh, within that contact tracing. And then obviously another good activity is to associate the pin with those animal movements and also diagnostic laboratory submissions as well. So one of those activities, I know that uh, when we were doing workshops back in 2018 and 19, Dr. Zabel uh, helped us uh, work through some of the biosecurity checklists and some of the plans, uh, developing site-specific biosecurity plans, talking about enhanced biosecurity. Here's a picture of, uh, of an example of one of the maps that comes out of that program, having the enhanced uh, biosecurity plan, defining your lines of separations and your perimeter buffer area and uh, some of the other measures that go along with that. All that information, once again, is located on uh, securepork.org. Uh, there's some customizable templates also, uh, depending on your type of operation, whether you have indoor production types or indoor-outdoor production types. Uh, they've got uh, some really nice tools there for you to be able to use. So obviously disease monitoring, that's going to be another important part of that. Uh, you know, and as part of PQA Plus, there's obviously uh, tra uh, training, uh, sorry, caretaker training that always needs to happen along with this. So this is a good opportunity to be able to take to make sure that all your caretakers are trained to recognize some of the abnormal, abnormal production parameters or clinical signs that you might see uh, that could be suggestive of ASF, CFS, sorry, CSF or FMD and how to be able to look for that every day. And like Dr. Shear said, 
Unfortunately, with many of those, we have contemporary diseases that look just like it, so you're probably not going to be able to diagnose it. But it's important for those caretakers to be able to recognize that and then at least be able to contact their herd veterinarian and say, hey, something doesn't look right here, so we're going to need to, to take a closer look at that. And then they can decide if it does look like that to get the state and federal officials in, involved and whether or not they need to generate a foreign animal disease investigation. So once uh, we have an, a confirmed FAD outbreak, uh, samples are going to need to be collected and test negative in order for a movement permit to be issued within a control area. And one of the concerns uh, really got to be as we started to look at this uh, was, well, what happens, and I think Dr. Shear hit upon this uh, uh, very succinctly in his talk, is do we have enough veterinary capacity to be able to do that? And what happens if that initial outbreak is fairly extensive, you know? Um, so uh, it was a really nice collaboration between Iowa State University, the National Pork Board, the American Association of Swine Veterinarians, and the Multi-State Partnership uh, for Security and Agriculture. They developed a program and are getting ready to kick it off, which is called the Certified Swine Sample Collector Training Program. Uh, and essentially, I'll cover a little bit more here, but essentially it is a way to certify staff on the farm to go through a training program so that in the event of a foreign animal disease, after the detection of the first case of foreign animal disease, that we can have people on the farm trained to be able to collect those samples and uh, submit them under the guidance of a Category 2 veterinarian in order to be able to collect and get those farms tested in order to get those movement permits. So it's a really nice standardized curriculum led by certified veterinarians that includes both classroom and hands-on training. So the trainers themselves will have to be USDA Category 2 accredited veterinarians with some swine experience. And those are con really controlled at the state level, so they'll have to work with their state animal health official to, uh, to understand the training that they need to, to be able to receive for them to be able to become trainers. After that, they can either, those uh, Category 2 veterinarians, in order to be able to start certifying people, they need to have a business relationship with the owner of the pigs on the farms where the individuals are trained, or they can perform training by the request of the site's Category 2 accredited veterinarian under who the collectors will be submitting samples. So the trainees, the people who will be getting trained, they have to be approved by the Category 2 accredited veterinarian. Uh, they have to be a valid PQA plus certification holder. And then they have to attend the sample collection training session. They have to pass a written examination covering the training curriculum. And then they also, in addition to the written examination, they have to successfully complete hands-on evaluation demonstrating competency on how to collect, how to package, and how to submit those samples and send them off to a diagnostic laboratory. So a little bit more on the curriculum. So in-person is the preferred method, but virtual can be acceptable. The trainers will review videos and handouts. So there are a couple of different tiers there. Tier one uh, are, will be uh, trainees that can be trained on how to collect blood, blood swabs, oral fluids, nasal swabs, and processing fluids. Tier twos will be those uh, who are trained in tier one, but can also collect ta sorry, tonsil, spleen, lymph node, tracheal swabs, or also vesic uh, sorry, vesicular fluid as well. They'll go through some disease recognition videos covering each of the three uh, foreign animal diseases, uh, and including some additional topics uh, such as biosecurity, animal restraint, and sample submission as well. And then at the end, once again, they'll have to uh, pass a 25 question exam. So after they do the in-class portion, then they'll go out and do a hands-on portion. Afterwards, they'll do that in person where the trainer will actually demonstrate the technique, and then the trainee themselves will go ahead and practice and then show proficiency that they, that they know and that they're proficient at being able to collect for each one of those sample types. Now, the good news about this is uh, here at Iowa State, we have a very talented a uh, person in our visual graphics department who works for the uh, Swine Medicine Education Center. She put together a, a really nice series of um, materials here on each of the different methods. So here you can see the one, this one is on bleeding. Actually, it has a QR code, so it'll actually, if you take your uh, cell phone and scan over that, it will go ahead and pull up the videos. They've got really nice videos actually demonstrating the entire process as well. 
The good news about that is those are actually available today. And it's actually, if you're in the process of just wanting to train farm staff to do it for endemic diseases, uh, uh, it, it works really well. And let me tell you, as someone in extension, uh, working with a veterinarian in Florida who's never had to bleed pigs before, this was a nice resource that I could send them to and, and for them to, to be able to collect blood on a pig. It was actually a small animal veterinarian. So, so those are also located on securepork.org. Uh, you can see it's highlighted there on the main page or you can get to it going to the training materials and then under the uh, disease monitoring section. So really nice tool, uh, that training here I know in Iowa is getting ready to kick off. I think uh, Dr. Kaizen and his team are getting ready to start to train Category 2 veterinarians here very shortly. So, so AgView, so what is that? Talk a little bit more about that. It was a really nice investment made by the uh, National Pork Board to really develop a s software piece. And it's a free software available to producers and uh, to really help with foreign animal disease preparation. The nice thing about that is it stores, you know, both premise identification, it ties all the pig movements to the farm premises, it gathers all that data prior to the incident, so kind of in peacetime. It's, uh, it holds all that data securely. It will, uh, it complements other software platforms. So in other words, you, if uh, some of the data, there are some uh, that they already have automated, um, I can't remember, APIs they're called. So some of the data, the movement data in particular, can already seamlessly transfer between the two programs. And the data will only be released at the producer's request. But if they get to a situation where the state animal health official requests that data, uh, they, can, they can give that permission and then that, that information can be transferred over to the state animal health official. So getting data into AgView, so you can, like I said, you can enter premise information, movement information, you can even upload your biosecurity site plans as well. So there's a process where you can actually enter some of that data directly into the application, or there's also an upload feature as well. So like you say, there, uh, some of these have these application program interfaces, such as Metafarms, I believe, is one of the software programs that has an API, so that will seamlessly transfer, the, transfer that information over. Uh, ones that don't, if you can export the data out of your third-party software, you can clean and format that uh, to the AgView standards and then upload it. Or AgView can also uh, take in uh, formatted Excel spreadsheet uh, templates because I know some people will store or uh, keep all their movement data in Excel spreadsheets as well. So here's just an example of some of the data that gets pulled across. You see so the premise information, you have company name, site name, the premise identification number, 911 addresses, latitude, longitude, site capacity, emergency contact information. All that information gets stored in AgView. Movement data, the pieces that are important there, there's six important pieces there. You need a source premise identification number, a destination premise identification number, the number involved in the shipment, the shipment date and the shipment or uh, movement type. So I guess there's five there and you can see the different movement types over there as well. So the nice part about AgView, once you get all that information in there, uh, particularly the uh, latitude long longitude, it's very easy to visualize all those movements. So if you're looking where your situation and you have a farm that may be deemed as a potentially dangerous contact, you can see and AgView will allow you to look at all the, uh, to do a really quick assessment of all those potential movements in and out of that site for, uh, for a uh, time period. So it allows you to just do a little bit quicker uh, uh, review of that, all those uh, potentially, or all those movements that you would want to take a closer look at within that 30 day uh, time period. So it's really kind of a nice piece of software. Once again, free, produ free to producers, you can get your free account at porkcheckoff.org uh, slash agview. So let's talk a little bit about the last piece, the one of the last acronyms we're going to talk about is U.S. SHIP, okay? So let's talk a little bit more about what that is exactly. So U.S. SHIP stands for the U.S. Swine Health Improvement Plan, and it really it's modeled after the National Poultry Improvement Plan. And then the thing that's really neat about that, uh, you can Google U.S. Swine Health Improvement Plan, and that, uh, that will pop up there. There's a website dedicated to that. It's kind of unique uh, in that both of those are uh, industry, state, and federal partnerships. Uh, this started out as a pilot program funded by US USDA and National Pork Board. We have investigators from Iowa State, South Dakota State, University of Minnesota, and Kansas State, 
all involved in that. So for those of you maybe who aren't uh, as familiar with the National Poultry Improvement Plan, that's kind of how it started. That was established back in 1935 uh, for uh, some endemic diseases. You see there's some Salmonella pylorum, Mycoplasma galliceptacum, and then the hypothavian influenzas. And the idea behind that was really to help sustain export markets and ongoing interstate commerce in unaffected states and regions. And really the goal is the demonstration of freedom of disease outside of trade impacting control areas. Okay. So the, part, the participation is voluntary and universal within the poultry industry, Im implemented across U.S. poultry and egg industries, and it's officially recognized standards of poultry health. The thing where I think this gets to be particularly uh, uh, promising for the swine industry, if that's a model that we can successfully adapt, I think we're really able to see if we compare the last two outbreaks of high path avian influenza. In 2015, we had the, the first outbreak of high path avian influenza. There were 60 countries that banned poultry meat after the outbreak. Um, but in all the work that's been done for the most recent one, uh, with the most recent outbreak, there were only two countries that banned, right? So it kind of says when that program gets to be established and matured, our trading partners understand what's all involved in that program. Uh, you can see the, the potential impact is. So, you know, potentially you get excited to say if that's something that we can, we can have similar for the U.S. swine industry would certainly be potentially helpful. So U.S. SHIP, you'd say what the end goal would eventually be is to help establish a national playbook of technical standards, you know, to provide a uniform approach to disease prevention, response, and recovery by each of the participating states. So really, we talk about it centering on prevention right now and then demonstration of freedom of disease outside of control areas in the event that we have a foreign animal disease on, uh, in our domesticated pig herd. The ASF and CSF monitor, those certifications will be held at the individual site level. And the participants there will be farm sites and slaughter facilities as well. So what is the purpose of that certification? Obviously, as they kind of look at it, it's kind of that next evolving step of that FAD preparedness, right? It helps us continue to develop uh, the prevention, response, and recovery. While at the same time, if you think about it, it really should help us continue to reduce the impact of recurring endemic diseases of high consequences, right? As we start to develop more standards for a foreign animal disease, those biosecurity steps should really help to mitigate some of the disease spread that we have of our endemic diseases. And really the end goal, once again, is to hopefully implement this NPIP-like program for the U.S. pork, uh, US pork industry. So really that national playbook, once again, in those three fundamental areas, talking about biosecurity, traceability, and surveillance. Demonstration of freedom of disease, that's why we talk about the, we have an ASF and CSF monitored status for both peacetime and wartime. So you see a little bit of how that process works out. We've had, uh, we're in year two of the pilot right now. We've had one house of delegates, but what we've, what we've, you have is you have a program that gets executed there and implemented by the producers and packers. And then what happens is you have a group that continues that's made up of producers, packers, veterinary medical offers from the state, uh, sorry, officials from the state and federal health organizations. You got veterinarian, diagnosticians, microbiologists. They're going to look at potentials for new standards and uh, the, to bring forth to what's called the House of Delegates. Okay, And then the House of Delegates meetings, the group gets together and decide, is that a standard that we want to adopt as part of the program or not? They get voted on. Those that get that pass will ahead get put into the program, get adopted, and then the official state agencies in each state will administer the program and then you can see and you just continue to do that on and on. Like I say, the poultry industry has done that very successfully since 1935. That's what we're hoping to get done here with the U.S. SHIP program. What's been the interest so far? So we've got a total of 28 states that have expressed interest in participating in the U.S. SHIP pilot, and that essentially covers over about 99% of the U.S. domestic swine. So once again, you can see we're integrating, you know, working very closely with our partners at the Swine Health uh, Information Center with Pork Checkoff, taking those available programs, integrating it together within those three, uh, those three areas of sampling and testing, biosecurity, traceability, start to form and develop a national playbook for uh, U.S. preparedness. 
So we had the first House of Delegate meeting last year to so start to develop the first year requirements uh, for, and then now we're in the process of starting to enroll sites within that. What were the year one requirements for enrollment? You had to have a premise identification information. You had to have a current and active veterinary client patient relationship with a veterinarian. Uh, you had to be from a, a farm that didn't uh, participate in garbage or swill feeding. Uh, international, uh, you had to have any international visitors observed five days downtime upon uh, returning to the United States. They have to complete a biosecurity survey upon enrollment into the U.S. SHIP program. Uh, keep live uh, animal movement records and practice sharing with the official state agencies. And then, but there were no sampling and testing requirements for year one, still working out uh, what the peacetime sampling requirements look like. And at that first year House of Delegates meeting, so we voted on uh, these standards as well as voted on the working groups for year two. All right, some of those year two working groups within each of those three disciplines. From a biosecurity standpoint, there's been a uh, feed biosafety group led by Dr. Jordan Gebhardt and his uh, colleagues at Kansas State. They're looking at a couple of different areas, looking at the responsible import of feed ingredients from ASF or CSF positive regions, as well as feed biosafety in the event of an ASF CSF incursion here in the U.S. Uh, I led a team uh, working with Dr. Monse Tor Morell from the University of Minnesota, looking at the integration of secure pork supply uh, site plans into uh, the U.S. SHIP program. Dr. Roger Main is working on uh, what, what a transportation sanitation uh, plan eventually look like. Uh, so he's got a working group looking at that, coming forward with some potential recommendations. And then Dr. Brett Marsh working on uh, looking at live animal, mar the different live animal marketing channels. Within the traceability area, the year two projects that's been going on uh, this spring and summer, uh, Dr. Giovanni Trevesan has been working on looking at a case study with traceability practices from other pork export markets, such as Brazil, Canada, Denmark, and the Netherlands. Dr. Jim Lowe from the University of Illinois has been working with uh, some uh, participants on a small-scale demonstration project with a subset of U.S. ship participants in one plant looking at uh, a traceability project and how they would integrate using AgView into that. A team of Dr. Jeff Zimmerman, Jerry Torreson, and Jane Christopher Hennings are leading the charge on the sampling and testing year two projects, and they're looking at completing the negative cohort study, some further modeling on disease spread, expanding ASF and CSF PCR assays, clarifying assay appro approval process, and then how they could leverage this uh, certified sampler training and assessing the integration potentially into the program as well. So you can see, so then what that'll ha what'll happen is they'll potentially bring forth potential standards to our next, next House of Delegate meeting, which will be September 6th through the 8th in Minneapolis, and then those will get voted on, and there could be other resolutions for working groups for year three. So you see this continuous improvement cycle, then they'll have working groups that'll work on other potential standards, and then uh, year over year, that's kind of how we continue to do it. So you might ask yourself, you know, why should I consider, you know, participating? And part of the reason why we're in the process of signing people up now, right? So this is really the next step in FAD preparation. Of, I kind of sit back in my extension seat and watch all the these different groups working on this. This really is kind of that next step. We have a successful pilot program that can be built on you know, that helps to streamline interstate movement between certified sites. Hopefully, you know, as the program matures, we'll establish international recognition for trade, expand program for certifying endemic diseases. How do I enroll? There's an enrollment process. You just work with the, uh, contact your official state agency. That's the Iowa Department of uh, Ag here and Dr. Kaizen's group. You enroll your swine production and slaughter facility premises with the OSA. You acknowledge, uh, sign an acknowledgement of and compliance with the requirements for certification and you can com complete the biosecurity survey. So real quickly here, just a few uh, demographics here from where we're sitting so far as we started to enroll sites at the beginning of the year. So as of June, we've got about 5,900 sites enrolled in uh, about 26 states. So here's a little bit of breakdown of the states. So the biosecurity survey uh, is, consists of 10 questions looking at uh, transportation, sanitation, uh, rent, uh, 
mortality disposal, one of the questions we had was to look at the integration of secure pork supply amongst the different production types. And you can see we've already got, even before the program start, we've already got a high uh, acceptance rate uh, within the sites that are enrolling within that. So real quickly from an on-farm preparedness standpoint, you know, what does that look like compared farms that, uh, you know, are prepared and those that aren't. You know, if you look at between ship and secure pork, so we already talked about there being a lot of overlap. So let's look through just a couple examples really quick. So, you know, obviously we've got a pre prepared producer, you know, that's within a control area. We know that they're not infected, but they're definitely affected since they're in the control zone, right? So they're, they're certified in ship, you know, they're, um, they're, uh, from a traceability, they've already got verified, they're tracking their animal movements. From a biosecurity standpoint, they've got a written plan implemented prior and then uh, uh, implemented the final steps once there's been an outbreak. They've got uh, trained certified samplers on the farm and they've got an ag view account already created and updated and dated regularly. So when it comes to the point of requesting a movement, uh, with their state animal health officials, it gets to be really easy to share the information and they're gonna be able to get their uh, permit very, very quickly. What if you got a prepared producer in a, in a uh, but they're in a free area? So it's similar to the one before, uh, but there's no restrictions on movements for them, but hopefully they'll be able to demonstrate to their trading partners the ability to bring back exports once that, uh, once that program gets mature. So kind of like the high path avian influenza example. So what if we contra contrast that to some producers who are not prepared, right? You have an unprepared, uh, sorry, unprepared producer in a control area. So, you know, they're not certified in SHIP, so they've got a verified pin, but they're not tracking animal movements. They started a written plan of biosecurity, but they're not really finished. And, you know, they didn't get anybody trained in surveillance, so they're gonna kind of wait for the herd vet. But, you know, who knows how many other sites that herd vet's gotta go to, and if he's been to a positive site, maybe he doesn't wanna come there. And from an ag view standpoint, meant to create an account, but hasn't gotten it done. So, hey, they may wanna be able to move pigs, but if they don't have all the information ready for the permit, it's gonna take them a lot longer than what they would, what they might want to be able to do. But they have to have all these steps in place. So you can see there's some potential for business interruption for for that producer if they don't have all these things prepared. And, uh, you know, same sort of thing, you know, for the unprepared producer in a free area, you know, if we get to the standpoint of, you know, where there's, um, you know, they may be free now, but they could be in a control area tomorrow. I'm just gonna put them that much further back. So finally, kind of a call to action in summary, you know, what are the things we can get done today while we're in peacetime, you know, enroll and become certified and ship, so you can contact your, the official state agency here, enhance the traceability by creating an AgView account, implement those biosecurities, go into securepork.org as a good uh, a tool, and improve that on-farm surveillance. Look at and talk to your herd vet about getting uh, some people trained through the certified sampler collecting program. So uh, we do have some FAD prep guide stuff at the Iowa Pork Industry Center, and we're going to be doing some additional trainings here in August and September. So uh, be looking for those at the ipicia.state.edu website. So with that, acknowledge uh, Pam and Tyler, Justin, Jamie, and then also Mark Storley, who helped put some of these slides together. And if I got question, time for questions, otherwise I'll hang around afterwards and I'll take some then. Thank you much for your time. Mike. So, went through three programs, Secure Pork Supply, AgView, and the U.S. SHIP. Um, I'm not a producer, but just to help me understand, um, is there a chronicle order, or is that in, in your uh, uh, summary slide kind of mentioned U.S. SHIP? Yep. It's <laughs> too many, right? Feed up into U.S. ship. I mean, if a producer is sitting out here, yeah, and maybe overwhelmed with a lot of different programs. Yep. Do they? I mean, if he said, "I'm going to do ag." Yep. 
Yep, and AgView would be great for that traceability piece, right? Because they can put, go ahead and put their premise identification and they can track their movements together, okay? So that's one piece, helps takes care of the traceability part. If uh, you look at the materials within Secure Pork, that'll help you with the biosecurity, but it also has the traceability component in there as well as some of the disease recognition standpoint. The nice thing about the U.S. SHIP program is, is it's going to integrate and use those other two programs that all rolls together. And it kind of, I, I kind of look as U.S. SHIP as the hub of hosting all those other two. Those other two are tools that can be used inside, you know, within the U.S. SHIP as kind of having that certification uh, piece and program in there. So I don't really think of them as in, independently or separately. They're all tools that really work together with a lot of overlap between them. 